Olivia O'Leary is not here tonight to speak of the history of journalism, but of its future. Olivia is known to many of us here who listen to the radio, or read newspaper articles, or watch television. For her fearlessly independent thinking, she grew up in Boris County, Carlow. Her grandfather, John O'Leary, was a Kilkenny man from Gregnamana. He was a respected and inspiring local historian and was the first president of Kilkenny Archaeological Society. Olivia is undoubtedly one of Ireland's most respected journalists. Who better to voice an opinion on the future of journalism, something that will matter to us all? Please give a warm welcome to Olivia O'Leary. Thank you very much, Anne, and I'm delighted, indeed honoured, to uh, be here addressing the Kilkenny Archaeological Society. I only knew one grandparent who was my grandfather, John O'Leary, old John O'Leary, as he was known. And um, I would like to think that he would have been pleased to hear me talk about some of the things I want to talk about tonight. And there are two things in particular I want to talk about. As, as a journalist, an, an elderly journalist now, I often feel maybe I'm more the past of journalism than the future of journalism. However, that's the great thing about journalists, you know, they never give up. Um, but two of the things that I really want to talk about tonight are two values. One, the fact that truth, or at least facts that have been checked in as far as possible, are valuable. And that should be what journalism and news is all about. Checked, monitored information. And the second thing I want to talk about is the honest and honorable trade of journalism, which requires um, that people are properly paid, properly trained, and given enough time to do their work. Now, both those things are under threat at the moment by developments which have brought wonderful things to us in terms of communications, uh, in terms of the way, for instance, during COVID that we were all able to uh, communicate with one another and that some of us, some of us, were able to keep doing our jobs because we had the internet, we had Zoom. Uh, all of these developments made what could have been a really disastrous period into a, a, a livable period. We limped along, but we, we, we did live through it. So I'm not in any way dissing the sort of technical marvels that have come to us, but I am pointing up that we don't have to accept it all with open arms without a critical eye. My brother told me proudly last year that he hasn't bought a newspaper in 15 years. And that is why you are so spectacularly ill-informed, I told him. <laughs> Pay for your news, cheapskate. So that was the level at which that particular conversation was, was conducted. But to me, taking your news from social media only, and so many young people do that, is the equivalent of taking it from the, from the graffiti splashed on the school playground wall. Unless it's from a reliable, known, news outlet, you can't rely on it yourself. What you pay for when you buy the Irish Times, when you look at the RTE news, because you've paid your license fee, is monitored, checked out information. But when you read those reliable sources of news on your Facebook and your Google search, which, which you, you will, you'll get the Irish Times, you'll get the RTE stuff, you're getting them for free, and that's what's destroying the whole business model of journalism. And naturally, being a journalist, I care about that. Um, the reliable sources of monitored news that are under threat, it's not just the Irish Times and RTE, it's the Kilkenny people, or it's good online sites like The Journal. They're threatened by the very internet giants that give away the work of proper journalists for free to attract clicks and advertisers and massive profits. Why would you pay for your Irish Times when you can simply see it come up on Facebook? As an advertiser, why would you advertise in the Kilkenny people if you can follow all the people who are reading the Kilkenny people and dozens of other places for free, follow them online? So the message from this medium, from the internet, is that news comes free. You don't have to pay for it. As a result, 
the internet giants have destroyed the existing funding model for monitored, verified news. And the fourth estate, a cornerstone of any democracy, including this one, is under threat. Countries and governments, and particularly successive Irish governments, have bowed down before them and let it happen. The problem is that we walked into this like children into a bonfire because we were attracted by the dazzle. I remember having a long argument with a, a lovely young producer who worked with me in radio a few years ago. And she, like all the young journalists and producers of that generation, had been brought up to worship at the shrine of digital technology. And she was arguing with me over a piece that I'd written and was about to broadcast, and she was saying that Newspapers and media outlets were delighted to have their stories picked up by Google or Facebook for free. It was a treat for them to be featured on uh, Facebook or Google, who were absolutely no threat to the existing uh, news system. You poor idiot, I said. <laughs> Don't you know that there will soon be no money to pay you or me to do our work or even to train us? if our work is given away for free online so that nobody feels the need to buy a newspaper and advertisers are already f following all of those freeloaders online. And, okay, my young friend might have been right in saying that the internet had widened the readership for traditional news outlets. But if that wider readership isn't paying, then that whole model doesn't make sense financially. And it will destroy proper monitored and investigative journalism, and it's already doing so. And I'm sorry if I sound boring when I say proper monitored and investigative journalism, but believe you me, we spend hours, days, weeks checking things out, trying to make sure they're right. And okay, you might sometimes be tempted to put something in the paper that maybe one tiny little niggle of your mind says, are you really sure, are you really sure? And you go reluctantly and you lift the phone and, you know, chances are you get the very person who says, actually, you know, you're, you're wrong about that. And your heart falls because you've just spent three weeks. But on the other hand, you haven't put out something that is, is wrong. Um, you've got to pay for proper news and investigative journalism. It takes training, it takes time to produce a professional journalist and to produce reliable, high quality information. You wouldn't expect your solicitor to work for free. You wouldn't expect your doctor to work for free, your teacher, your architect, your plumber, your electrician, your dry cleaner, your shop assistant to work for nothing. But Google and Facebook have taught a whole generation that they don't have to pay for their news. So let me show you what's happening. In the last 10 years, print sales have declined dramatically. In the case of the Irish Times and the Irish Examiner, average daily print sales have more than halved in the last 12 years. It can be difficult to get accurate figures for print circulation because a lot of newspapers have become very coy about giving you the exact information. If you look on the Irish Times website, it says, circulation is no longer audited. I wonder why. But the decline goes on every year. In 2018, the Irish Independent had a combined print and digital edition circulation of 87,512, down 6% year on year. Overall, the daily print market dropped 10% year on year in the second half of 2018, 10%, while sales in the Sunday market fell by 9%. Now, you can say, what does it matter? Like, print and paper are going out of fashion anyway. Um, it's cumbersome, it's expensive, it's slow. Yeah, print may be on the way out. And a number of people, including me, I'm not a total uh, Neanderthal, have moved to the digital um, uh, edition of the, of, of the papers. Uh, the Irish Times, for instance, claims that the switch to digital has more than offset the decline in print sales. But that has its own problems. There's no escaping the reality that the shift to digital has undermined a, a successful business model. Paid newspaper sales have fallen sharply. Revenue from print advertising for national titles have declined massively. The advertising sales that provided more than 65% of revenue for newspapers have also migrated online, where they've been captured overwhelmingly by digital platforms. Um, and I'm just here going to quote Vincent Crowley, the chairman of newspaper representative body News Brands Ireland. He told the Iraqis Committee on Media last December, he said, 
The economic model which once sustained newspapers is broken. Revenues for print advertising have dropped 75% from a high of 367 million in 2007 to 87 million in 2019. The forecast for 2020 is about 60 million. This decline, he says, has not been replaced by digital advertising, which is being hoovered up by the likes of Google and Facebook, who took 420. 425 million in digital advertising from this market last year, compared with only 26 million for national news publishers. So that's where all the advertising money is going. Almost all the money went to the international platforms, publishers and networks, not to the Irish Times online, not to the Examiner online, or the Irish Independent, or RTE, or the Kilkenny people. So going digital hasn't saved the advertising business of these news outlets. Indeed, PwC's Media Outlook Report 2020-2024 on the global newspaper industry showed the inevitable, that as print advertising continues its decline and the digital version of papers isn't capturing that advertising, more publishers are re-evaluating their content offerings and reporting that their subscription revenue boosted by digital growth, has displaced advertising as their most significant revenue stream. In other words, proper monitor journalism, where people go out and check facts and dig up stories that government and corporations don't want you to hear, yes, that sort of quality newspaper and broadcast journalism is going to get dearer and dearer. And I'll talk more about the implication of that price wall in a few minutes. What about radio and television news? Let me just take some water. Um, COVID-19 has increased the audiences for traditional RTE and uh, commercial station bulletins in the last two years, and that's important, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But there was, up to 2019, a big fall off in audience numbers. Increasingly, a younger generation doesn't want to sit down and watch the news at six or the news at nine as their parents did or listen to the radio at lunchtime. They get it on their phones from Google or Facebook and snippets from reliable traditional news sources may get equal billing with conspiracy theorists and other far out groups. So the following can happen. And my daughter is here, so she's going to murder me. When, when the great Dublin comedian, Brendan Grace, the butler, died in recent years, there was naturally enough wall-to-wall -wall coverage of it on radio and television. He was somebody for whom there was great affection. My daughter came in to me at the time and she says, Mum, it says on Google that Brendan Grace hasn't died at all. It's all a lie. And I took a deep breath and I said, do you think RTE would have put out the news that Brendan Grace was dead if they hadn't checked it with the hospital, with the doctors, with his family? In fairness, she agreed with me that RTE wouldn't have said he was dead unless he was dead, and she now always checks things out on RTE or the Irish Times. Look up COVID or a Google search, and as well as all the government health messages, you'll see Amazon ads for COVID-19, the greatest hoax in history, the startling truth behind the planned world takeover. Paperback, 29th September 2020, by a Dr. Vernon Cole. Coleman. It's all up there. And how do you differentiate? Brighter educated kids might differentiate, other people might not. But even then, when youngsters are bright enough or informed enough to choose a reliable source of information, they're still not paying for it. And the Irish Times, in its submission to the Commission on the Future of the Media, tried to take comfort from the fact that people would find their stories uh, on Google search and read them. And the Irish Times said, readership of the titles last year was probably at its highest ever. Page views of irishtimes.com reached a record of 20 million on a single day during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis, reflecting our continuing relevance to readers, all the more so as they sought factual and trustworthy information in the middle of a global panic. Yeah, people did read these trustworthy articles from the Irish Times, having seen them listed on Google or Facebook. But in most cases, they didn't pay for it. People, as you all know, are allowed a certain number of free visits to the Irish Times site when it comes up on the, on, on, on the Google lists. Um, and they get a number of free articles before they have to pay. So that 20 million on a single day may represent very, very little revenue 
to the hardworking journalists who put that paper and those articles together. Newspapers can't continue like this. You can't fund reliable, quality news like this. I came through a golden period. You know, you only realize when you look back how lucky you were. I came through a period where journalists were paid and they had permanent staff jobs. But now, even senior journalists on newspapers are either working from shift to shift with no contract or on, at best, two-year contracts. There's little money to give young journalists time to be trained or to, to and, and the best training, by the way, is on the job, um, or to do investigative work. The senior correspondents might get a bit more leeway, but increasingly they are asked to feed the almighty website because the Irish Times website, for instance, is updated every few hours or so. So a political correspondent who's trying to do a background piece on a particular political wrangle or row that's going on has to stop to feed the almighty website every two or three hours. I mean, the notion of maybe getting a week, I remember being given four or five weeks to do a series of articles, and I needed that time. And that was how you built up contacts and you built up pigeonholed knowledge of, of what went on. But the poor unfortunates now are maybe given an hour to put a piece together. And the, and the chances of checking it out, of going back, of going back to those contacts to see what's happened in the meantime, there's very, very little time for that because time is money. So, to dig deeper, to go off for a few weeks and dig around to become expert in some particular area is impossible. And who benefits? The powerful and the corrupt who can't be effectively challenged. Because you need to know as much as that company who is behaving in either an illegal or an unacceptable way. You need to know as much as they do uh, about what's in the background. And that takes time. I mean, Frank MacDonald, the wonderful former environmental officer, uh, correspondent of the Irish Times, Frank would spend weeks sitting in the company's office digging stuff up. And that's why and how he was able to do that wonderful series of articles about the brown paper envelopes that changed hands at uh, Dublin City Council and all the rezoning scandals that have since emerged in the tribunals. Uh, it was because he had the time and the energy and the determination. That time isn't given anymore. More and more of the content in newspapers, in local newspapers in particular, because they have been very hard hit. They're, they're very low on staff. So a lot of the time, content comes from PR handouts. That happens in daily newspapers as well. And that happens when you've got fewer journalists and more space to fill. So with fewer journalists and the ones who remain acting as, as copy tasters rather than originators of news stories, we are in the hands of the big corporations who can afford to hire masses of public relations people, of spinners, who will set the agenda. And those big corporations and political parties will not therefore be held to account in any real way for what they do, and society will be at their mercy. When we lose somebody from one of the merry band of journalists, when they leave the family to go over to the dark side, public relations, the rest, of us, the rest of us behave a bit like an Orthodox Jewish family or perhaps a Roman Catholic family do when somebody leaves the faith or marries outside the fold. We, we have a sort of a funeral down in the pub and we mourn their loss and we, we, we maybe hope that they will see the error of their ways and return to us. And even when we see their spanking new Mercedes and the house in Fox Rock, we shake our hands and wonder where it all went wrong for them and still hope that they will turn around to the path of truth. But seriously, I have seen fine journalists, like the cream of the profession, the people that I would always read, the people who, who, who made it my business to buy their newspaper because they were so good. They've left the profession in the last year, and I'll just mention to Fiach Kelly, um, Deputy political, political Editor of the Irish Times, who I think he used to stay up all night. He, 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 he would have such good news stories. He'd have such an edge. Susan Mitchell, the Deputy Editor of the Sunday Business Post and also their, their health correspondent. Um, uh, they left last year 
to take up jobs in government. Kelly is to be special advisor to Helen McEntee, the Minister for Justice. Mitchell, possibly the finest health correspondent Irish journalism has ever produced, has gone as an advisor to Stephen Donnelly, the health minister. Now, you can say, well, at least they're, you know, they're helping the government and that's good for the country, but I, I'm seeing it from where I stand. Two journalists who would ordinarily have held the new government to account will instead be working for it. And when people of that quality leave, journalist, leave journalism behind, the stampede starts and the morale drops, and that's started to happen already. So, good news for the rich and bad news for the poor. What do we have to do to make good journalism and good journalism outlets viable again? In newspapers, the only way that any sort of quality can be sustained is for the price now of the digital subscription to rise. As PwC said earlier, that's what's begun to happen. There isn't really the advertising to help out. Therefore, you're going to have to push up the price of the digital subscription. So we will in the future, those of us who are interested in monitored news and information, will be paying quite high prices for our digital subscriptions. It may be that advertisers will also pay to have access to ch such choosy, fastidious ABC customers. So that will be the new media business model. The Financial Times charges plenty for its subscription, and it laughs at The Guardian, which just asks you for a donation. The sort of people who read the FT will pay because they can afford it. The Guardian, in fairness to it, still has a conscience and feels that it shouldn't have a price wall which excludes poorer people from reading the sort of stories that they can read in The Guardian. So some of us will be okay, but poorer people who can't afford it and younger people who maybe don't care as much will have less and less access to reliable monitored news. This has massive consequences for politics and for democracy. I mean, we've seen the rise of populism around the world and in Europe, the extent to which people on a diet of social media prejudice and rumors will believe anything. So they're at the mercy of whatever is, is pushed out there, whatever rumor. I mean, look at Trump. Thank goodness we don't have to look at Trump much anymore, but he, he lied on Twitter all the time and he didn't think it was very important to tell the truth. The people who voted for him didn't think it was important whether or not he told the truth either. And all those journalists who constantly pointed out his untruths and his inconsistencies were ignored. I heard somebody uh, on radio from the US last year saying, I know he's lying, but it's what I want to hear. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook says black lives matter and that he cares about the situation to do with black people in, in America. And yet we know that Donald Trump used Facebook's tools to deliberately suppress and deny black and Latino people the vote in the US with no consequences. The architects of Brexit, particularly Dominic Cummings, have made it clear that they told whatever porkies were necessary to get Brexit done. And in both of those instances of populist politics, the internet giants played a very dark role. Look how Cambridge Analytica used information garnered from Facebook to, they claim, influence the last US election and the Brexit referendum. Only now are politicians finally waking up to the fact that governments have to assert control over these frat boys who run the internet giants. Facebook don't care about the damage that they're doing to those who use the platform or, or neither do they care about the chaos that they might cause. I'm sure mo a lot of you will have read Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen's testimony recently to a United States Senate committee that the company systematically and repeatedly prioritized profits over the safety of its users. She painted a detailed picture of an organization where the hunger to grow governed decisions with little concern for the impact on society. And based on her experience working for the company's civic integrity division and on the documents, clever woman, she brought all the documents out with her as well. She said that by directing resources away from important safety programs and encouraging platform tweaks to fuel growth, these performance metrics dictated operations. She said, a design that encouraged political divisions, mental health harms, and even violence. 
she pointed to Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg as the enforcer of this system. And you know, Meta, we'll talk in a minute about Meta. Why does he have to change Facebook's name? We know damn well why he's trying to change Facebook's name. We know, for instance, that this uh, Meta uni universe that he's talking about, the Metaverse, I think he calls it, that, that's not really ready. They're, really, they're trying a lot of it out still. That didn't have to be announced this week. That was announced this week because Francis Haugen was making life very hot for him and because Facebook shares were falling. The, an Irish voice raised against Facebook has been Dennis O'Brien. Not a great favourite with us journalists, but what he still said was interesting. The reason he's not a great favourite with us journalists is that he gets rid of any journalists who try to do very brave journalism. But anyway, that's, we will move on. Um, he's no longer involved, really, in, in Irish journalism. But he said... He called the company a threat to democracy and he likened its influence to the creeping authoritarianism of 1930s Germany. He said Ireland had allowed itself to become Facebook's laundrette for the biggest tax avoidance scheme in the world. And I, I'm nauseated and constantly surprised by the extent to which younger people put Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook on a pedestal and call him a visionary. He ain't a visionary. He's a businessman who abuses words like Facebook friends and Facebook community to make obscene profits. He's known about the Cambridge Analytica scandal for years, and he's done nothing until he realized now that the scandal is affecting his share price. He's vowing to change things. But he was the one who did the deal in 2007 to give developers of applications access to Facebook users' data in return for them building applications which would further expand Facebook's empire. He made the bargain. As the Irish song says, tha, tha, ma clownas dainta. He now asserts that protecting people's data is at the heart of everything we do. Really? In the early days of Facebook, Zuckerberg noted that his 4,000 Harvard colleagues, each of whom had given him their private information, trusted him. It's ironic that he then reportedly called them, and I apologize for the use of the word, dumb fucks. So those of you who get your news for free on Facebook have to ask whether, if you don't pay for the product, are you the product? Are you the fools? And yes, you are. Is that how you want to be manipulated? I don't have Facebook. I'm a suspicious old bat. I don't trust it, and rightly so. So how do we fund quality journalism? There are small things the state can do reducing VAT to 5% on newspapers and on digital products, ultimately reducing VAT to 0%, as is the case in Britain and other EU countries, allowing subsidies for the distribution and posting of newspapers, and the other thing, completing the long overdue review of the Defamation Act and reforming draconian defamation laws and high legal costs, which have the potential to put publishers out of business. But the biggest thing that any government can do to protect the future of quality journalism is to tackle the dominance of the tech platforms in the digital advertising market. To put some sort of control, to introduce some sort of regulation. The answer was suggested a number of years ago by a London University lecture. Uh, Justin Schlossberg. He argues that Google and Facebook gain traffic by using stories generated by the established media and newspapers, but it pays nothing for that content. So he says a levy should be placed on the billions made by Google and Facebook in order to build a fund to help reverse the decline in, in journalism. And when you think about a levy, it makes sense. Um, I mean, to journalists, these sites are stealing our work. They should pay. They should pay for our work. They should pay for the work of poets, musicians, actors, artists, whose work they steal as well. We shouldn't throw our hands up and say we can't control them. And God bless the Australians. The tough old Australians have passed a world first law aimed at making Google and Facebook pay for the news content that they use on their platforms. Google and Facebook screamed and hit back, but eventually they've had to sit down and negotiate. The EU is pushing forward with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which will carefully limit what's deemed a, a, a unacceptable uh, behavior by the big platforms. And it's based 
on the copyright principle, which protects intellectual property, i.e. journalists' work. And in this regard, the European Union Directive on Copyright and Neighboring Rights, which must be enacted by each member state by the end of 2021, is a potential game changer. It requires the platforms to negotiate bilaterally with publishers or groups of publishers licensing agreements for the use of their content. France um, is, is a little bit ahead of the, of the, the rest of us here. Um, the transposition of the European Directive is more advanced there, and there's evidence of progress. And a number of major publishers in France have been engaged in talks with Google about a form of license payments reported tentatively to total some 50 million a year, or about 4% of the annual revenue of the press. It's not much, but it's something. But the willingness of the digital giants even to consider such payments is an implicit acknowledgement that they know change is coming, but it ain't coming quickly enough. And not yet do we have an acknowledgement of the principle that news content producers should receive a return on their products. And the prospects for balanced bilateral negotiations on that principle are hobbled by the reality that the news industry is determined on them, to, to, dependent on them to provide the channels of access by readers to the news industry's sites. All the negotiation leverage is on one side. The Australian approach, based within competition law, with its process of forced arbitration if no agreement is reached, may be a better way to go. The problem in Ireland, though, is getting an Irish government to back a charge or a levy against Google or Facebook. Um, uh, you know, you do look at certain people who travelled to California to beg certain um, internet giants, you know, not to abandon their uh, data centre over in the west of Ireland. Most politicians don't want to touch these guys at all. And yet, it's the politicians' own arena of de democratic politics which is being eroded by a failure to rein in these burgeoning giants. It's being eroded to the, by the extent to which a free and reliable media, one of the cornerstones of any democracy, is being destroyed by a system where their work is not paid for. It's also being damaged by the nastiness of online attacks, which has coarsened public and political debate. The venom with which politicians, and particularly women politicians, are attacked by anonymous armchair warriors whenever they suggest any change has made it almost impossible for them to formulate policy. In the meantime, there's the immediate problem of what needs to be done to preserve the funding of responsible journalism. Let's take RTE, the main source of national public service broadcasting, which has suffered heavily from a loss of advertising revenue and an inefficient license collection system, which loses out on about a quarter a quarter of the potential revenue and has left it chronically underfunded. Pat Rabbit, a former communications minister and a bright man, was the one who first suggested that since so many people now consume news or programs on their phones or iPads or computers, that the old system of a TV license should be scrapped and should be replaced with a household charge, something that the Labour Party continues to believe in. Fine Gael, in its submission to the Future of the Media Commission, an independent body set up last year by the government, um, which reported, by the way, in July, but we still haven't seen the actual published version of the report, Fine Gael have also suggested a household charge. And they propose this could be collected by consolidating it into the local property tax and into commercial rates, or that it could be funded by a small increase in VAT. The charge would remain the equivalent of the 160 euros license payment that we all know, but it would be no longer based on the sort of receiver that's used. So it catches all the people who consume TV on their phones and computers. It was a really progressive idea, but after the water charges fiasco, political parties are uneasy about another household charge. Fianna Fáil didn't make any submission to the future of the uh, media uh, commission, and I'm not clear what their view is. Sinn Féin kicked to touch and say that the present license and advertising mix should continue. An Irrechthus committee a few years ago suggested that revenue should take over the collection of the license fee. But guess what? Revenue don't want to do it. 
they're very smart in revenue, you see, and they have a lot of compliance tax-wise at the moment. They're uneasy about maybe being made to collect a tax that may be unpopular. A recent leak of the report on the future of the media is understood to have concluded that the RTE license fee should be scrapped. It proposes that the license fee income should be replaced by funding directly sourced from the exchequer. You can imagine how well that went down with Pascal, huh? However, senior government figures are strongly opposed to taking on the burden of funding RTE on the exchequer. So it sounds to me uh, as though whether revenue like it or not, they will have to take on the collection of the license fee or the broadcasting charge or whatever it's called. They do the job efficiently. And they are paid to do the job. Many in government feel that any support of public service broadcasting should include in that definition the many local radio stations that are so important in their communities and which offer a range of coverage of local issues that RTE doesn't. Independent broadcasters of Ireland radio stations point out, and I can, I, they have a fair point, that when you add together their two national, four regional, one multi-city and 27 local radio stations, their combined weekly reach comes to 68% as opposed to RTE's 61%. Listen, we could argue figures all night long. There is nothing more obscure than figures to do with uh, listenership and newspaper circulation because all sorts of little tricks are being played to make them look bigger than they are. Um, though, but what can't be dismissed is the vital role role played by all those sources of information during the present pandemic. That and the vital role played by public service journalism in defending democracy and spreading vital and reliable information is why the state has to take a part in defending it. At a time when other countries not so far away were taking a different approach, for instance, it was important that Irish people had a reliable national and local source of up-to-the-minute information based on the public health advice of our medical and scientific experts, our officials and our government all during COVID. This was as near as many of us have got to a wartime situation where, as the old saying goes, careless talk costs lives. At times like that, you really do need your own reliable national sources uh, telling, telling you what to do. Otherwise, we're at the mercy of what may be done across the Atlantic or across the water. And the, the criticism that the government wasn't always as clear as it might have been, and, and, and that's a fair criticism sometimes, not as clear as it might have been in explaining its restriction, but still in all, the Irish media, print, broadcasting and online, did a solid job of keeping the flow of public service information going, putting out the public health information and warnings, helping to maintain a sense of solidarity and community, even among people isolated in their houses. They didn't encourage panic or conspiracy theories. They showed the courage of frontline workers. They reflected the best in all of us. They were also independent enough to query some of those decisions and try to hold those in charge responsible. And that's gold. It's pure gold in democratic terms. And we are lucky to have that tradition of reliable, independent news and information. But it doesn't come for free. It does not come for free. How could it come for free? We must pay for it either by buying a paper or an online subscription through license fee or taxation and by insisting that the social media giants pay copyright fees or levies for the journalism which attracts so much advertising and tra tra traffic and profit to their platforms. We must pay for it now before it's too late. Thank you.